I brought some friends up around about 19... When was that? In the, the middle 60s, to um, have a look at Dicky Beach. We were, we were renting our house at Dicky Beach, and they were so taken with the um, with the area that they rushed off down to Hens Cross um, to find out more about what land was available. And they came back. I didn't go with them. Uh, they came back with this brochure. Uh, started out saying things like. All the best people now are coming to Dickey Beach. Now that the bridge has gone in over Two Way Lake, all the best people are coming to Dickey Beach. Um, and rather quaint language uh, described it, spelt it D-I-C-K-E-Y, of course. And um, said um, electricity is soon to be available, golf courses being prepared. And I said, hang on, you, you just got this brochure from Hensel. The answer, they've got a heap of them. And, um, I said, I've got to have one of them. That would have been done in the 30s. Uh, and sure enough, they, I went down to Hensel's on first Monday after this, and uh, the girl behind the counter said, how, how many would you like? You know, they were still handing them out. Well, and it was quite a good map of it. Uh, sort of a four-page yellow um, Farlow and Hen Hensel. Farlow was in partnership with Hensel in those days. Um, and, uh, of course, within a matter of few years of all that, you couldn't get over there because the army had really taken it over. So um, I thought it was extraordinary that they were still using brochures in 1960, 66 or 67 as well, <laughs> of 1937, you know, stuff written in sort of the language of that era. So, um, yeah. and that resulted in those people buying um, uh, a house on Gun Gun Street. Um, Gordon already had done his. Um, and my family, my mother, she was a Robinson, and her father was a solicitor, James Nickel Robinson. And um, he, um, I'm not sure quite why, he uh, acquired a dairy farm, Mullaney, in the 20s and took his whole family, including my mother, up there. Well, one of the reasons probably was this, had, he had a family of about six kids, two sons, neither of whom showed any interest in doing the law, and one in particular was more towards farming. Um, but it could be that, and he had perhaps clients um, from Malay. Anyway, he established a sort of an office there that he went once a week to, uh, from sort of um, commuted on the train. And um, he, um, uh, they, that, the farm remained in Mullaney for, for many years. Uh, um, yeah, most of the family came back to Brisbane. My father was up there for a whole different reason. His father, would, or rather his dad, had been in, in the sort of um, drapery business. And he thought it was a good place for, for a branch of the Brisbane place to go to Mullaney. And so um, he was up there, and as you do, you, you met his wife. My, it was one of the Robinsons uh, there, and uh, so uh, you know, Mullaney sort of um, kind of has got a lot of memories for me. Our house hadn't been built. Those those two houses there are those there, You're looking looking west up to the lighthouse. That's those two houses there. Our land was there. Well, that's, that that was that was that was called Lambkin Flats. Which one? Uh, that, that one. one okay. It was Lambkin Flats, Lambkin's Flats. And Lambkin's was a sort of real estate agent in the main street. And I think they had a library too. Um, this was Burnsaw, B U R N S A W L, boarding house. That's King's, of course. You know, where the Pearl yes. the tennis court. Um, that's just where uh, Fristrams had their cafe and uh, boarding house there. Um, not a bit of bitumen to be seen, of course. The pavilion had been built, so it'd have to be... I, I could be a year out with that, I, I'm guessing, but they hadn't paved that area yet, you know, right. the Esplanade, as we call it. Um, that, all the tents were there and that camping ground. And by that time, Mum and Dad had built their place. That's the one with, that's got me and the other picture riding in front of it. That was... Uh, this this had permanent uh, people in it, although it was a rented house. They were uh, both garrison men were living there, 
I don't know whether you've had anything to do with the people of Jardine. It, it was a, they were quite a well-known yeah. family. Um, he was Mr. Jardine was uh, he'd have been a First World War veteran, I think. Um, he was in the um, in the garrison on Morton. Brought his family up from D.Y. in Sydney, and they rented there, and they were there for about four or five years. So I played with their kids. S similar situation. Um, a fellow called Bentley. He was on, he was on Bridie and his family was renting that place. This one behind us um, wasn't there either, I think. This was between us and the lighthouse. This, this tall place here, sort of a two-storey place, was built, was owned by a family called Nibbet, and he was a police magistrate. That day, there was always a pilot boat anchored out there. Matthew Flinders and the John Oxley used to patrol out there, and the boats would stop, and the pilots would go from the coast. And occasionally, it wasn't with great excitement, one of those pilot boats, rowing boats, would, c would come into King's Beach, you know, and sort of, uh, for some reason, a sick person or something like that, rather than go all the way back. I, I can't think of another beach in Queensland, or anywhere else perhaps, that gets as much shipping going, almost a touchable, you could almost yes, reach yes. out. And when that occurs, the cruise ships go through, I mean, some of the, the, the big ships, uh, during the war, it was fantastic. Some big convoys used to come through, especially at night. And, uh, we had a couple of, this is one of those sort of fables that gets grows, of course, in time, but um, on Bald Hill, Bald Knob, so it was a fairly prominent family um, called Kerr. Uh, they had, I think it's now a um, bed and bee type thing, but halfway up the range, Okay, I've been there too. Beautiful old home with attics and things like that. The architect that. was true. That's right. That was for the Kerr family. They were a wealthy uh, grazier family from the west. Uh, the mother, it was the Mrs Kerr who really had the money. Um, and they sort of set the social scene to some extent. They must have arrived there around about 42 or 43. Um, one of the last houses built, but two for all houses stopped being built. Anyway. She was, the story went, that she was appointed a sort of a spotter uh, to observe, because of the pond positions, could see out to sea um, any, um, any odd things. And an old, far older and longer standing resident were the elders who lived fairly close by, on the other side of the range, but within you know, a hundred or a quarter of a mile's distance. Both ladies later claimed that they saw the flash which was the centre of the pit. But there was an observation thing. Yeah. They used to signal, you know, or Morse code. Well, I think that was... There were, well, there were a number of structures, but the yeah. um, command post for Fort Bribey and Cowan were, were in Flounder. Yes, yeah. So that, that, and there's photos of it on, on a lean, I think, when it was being demolished. Right, yes. Yeah. So I can remember, um, soon after the end of the war, a friend of mine from Malayman staying with us, fascinated with anything like this, we climbed to get into it and, and to our surprise found the trap door at the top. You could get open and we were able to get in and you know came back through it and we said, yeah, you, you, last year you could get in because you certainly couldn't get in it during the war. And they had all slip trenches uh, sort of along the headland which were considered dangerous, don't go in those tunnels because they could fall in on them. Living in quiet Mulaney and coming down here for holidays, bristling with troops and all these houses down here have had been I'm taken over. I'm surprised they even let you into your house. No, well, they never were interested in our place. It was only... Um, the holidays continued. There was never any... The only obstacle was wire, wire entanglements were put all along King's Beach. The little tin cans on the stones there. Allegedly, anybody trying to get through the cans would rattle. So you can just imagine the Japanese were right. <laughs> rattling these bloody cans. <laughs> and of course, so signs were removed. Uh, never seen two Malayans or two men. Well, they were all taken out, so visitors wouldn't know where they were. Um, but life went on. The school closed, and the next closed. It was taken over, and the kids went to the scout room. But by the time I came to the school, for those last few years, months of 45, we were back in the old school. But it was just sort of in recovery stage then. But no, ordinary houses. I remember one night we were in the house next door. 
um, in those photos, that, that they had this house here. And we were we were, had friends staying there in that house there, and we were playing Monopoly or something like that. And um, you had to have the, what they call the brown out, not the black out, but the brown out. It was a sort of semi. Uh, and we had too many lights on. There was a rap on the door. It was a warden who said that uh, just called him and say your, your lights are too visible. Would you draw the curtains or turn that light off? Apart from that sort of thing, it was from a child's point of view, it was quite exciting. We saw cut jeeps. We'd never seen jeeps in our life before on the beach. But what I started to say, virtually all the houses from here down to the, to the start of the town, they seem to be army occupied. My memory says Americans, but I don't think they were certainly all Americans. Um, but, you know, the average citizen wasn't interfered with at all. I used to ride my bike through the tracks from that house down there, up virtually past the lighthouse, down to get the bread, and, uh, what was then Nellie's Bake House. Go to the butcher to get the meat, right down to Clark's and Chapman's to get the fish and put the ice works. Get the ice, there was no, no electricity. Well, there was electricity. Electricity had come in, as I said before, but we never had a refrigerator. We still had ice chests. No one put refrigerators in beach houses, or, because there was the EC Dunny in the back of everybody. There was no sewerage. Sewerage didn't come until I think about the 1970s or 60, certainly 